Okay, guys, welcome back. Um, today we'll continue on with the head. Um, we had started part three of the head in class, then we had started to go through the oral region, but we hadn't got very far. So we'll continue on with the oral region today, and then we'll also go through the nose and um, paranasal sinuses, as well as the ear and the eye. So again, we were talking about the oral region and we had just gotten to the tongue. Um, the tongue, which forms the inferior border of the oral region and really fills up the whole oral cavity when the mouth is closed. Um, the tongue is composed of muscles, right? It's, it's the whole mass of the tongue is actually muscular and it's covered by a mucosa. That mucosa that covers the tongue contains numerous different types of sensory receptors. We call those gustatory receptors um, because they give us the sense of gustation, which is taste. So those are our taste receptors. Um, the tongue has numerous different functions. The tongue's involved in mastication, which is just chewing. It's also involved in taste or gustation because it's got all of these um, gustatory receptors. It's involved in deglutition, which remember deglutition is swallowing. Um, articulation. Articulation is the manipulation of sound into speech. So like we produce sound in our larynx when our vocal cords vibrate. But we actually use, you know, our tongue, our teeth, our cheeks, our um, palate in order to articulate that sound into words. And the tongue is very, very important in articulation. And then finally, we also use it for oral cleansing, right? We kind of uh, use your tongue to kind of wipe around your mouth and get the food out of the little nooks and crannies in your mouth. When we look at the tongue itself, like if the tongue were like this, there's a terminal sulcus, which kind of back towards the, the posterior portion like that. Um, so the terminal sulcus is this little kind of groove like that. Um, there is also a central groove that kind of goes like this down the center of the tongue. But the terminal sulcus right here, the little V-shape, divides the tongue into an anterior part and a posterior part. The anterior part of the tongue is like what you would think of as the tongue, right? This is the area that has the little lingual papilla, um, papilla like little bumps, right? There are little lingual papilla um, that are kind of, or they're like different shaped papilla in different areas of the tongue. Um, we have on the next slide, you'll see them, but like valate papilla, um, filiform papilla, we have a fungiform or fungiform papilla, which are like big mushroom shaped, but we have all these little papilla or little like bumps on the surface of our tongue. Um, these bumps have lots of different taste receptors in them organized into little taste buds. Okay, so the papilla, have taste buds, which have taste receptors. And of course, that's how we get the, the sense of gustation or taste. Now the posterior portion of the tongue back here, back behind the terminal sulcus, is actually um, like lymphoid tissue. That's where we have a bunch of lymphoid nodules that are all congregated together. And we refer to that area as the lingual tonsil. On the underside of the tongue, or the inferior aspect of the tongue, we have something called the frenulum. Um, so like if you stick your tongue up eh, like that, and you see underneath in the, um, like the medial inferior aspect of the tongue, there's a little like, piece of tissue that anchors the tongue. It goes from the tongue down and then anchors at the um, inferior like aspect of the mouth down there. Um, that frenulum kind of limits the mobility of the tongue and uh, when the frenulum is too short, that is actually pathological, that is problematic. When the frenulum is too short, um, that's referred to as ankyloglossia. This is an L-O, ankyloglossia. When there's a really short frenulum, and that severely limits the mobility of the tongue. Um, and the problem with that is that it really interferes with speech. Again, the tongue is very important for articulation. 
Um, so when the frenulum is too short, you'll lose mobility of the tongue and speech becomes very different. This is where that term tongue-tied comes from. You say, oh, you know, someone's tongue-tied when they can't quite talk, when they can't, you know, get their words out, they're tongue-tied. Um, because literally, like, the tongue is tied down too short. The person, um, if you tell them to stick their tongue out, they typically will not be able to stick the tongue past the teeth. So the tongue only goes out like to the bottom teeth instead of, you know, it should go out much further than that. Okay, so here we see um, the tongue itself. Of course, the anterior aspect here and then the posterior aspect is back here. Um, you can see there's this like, midline groove along the tongue right here, but that terminal sulcus that we were talking about is back here. This kind of like V-shaped terminal sulcus, and that divides the tongue into the anterior tongue up front and the posterior tongue in the back. The posterior tongue, again, is not like, you know, taste receptors and, and whatnot. The posterior tongue is that lymphoid tissue. Um, so all of the little lymphoid nodules all congregated together, corrugate together, giving us the lingual tonsil. Um, when we look at the anterior tongue, that's where we have all of the different papilla. And in those papilla, we have receptors, some of which are taste receptors, some are gustatory receptors. Again, there are numerous different types. Um, filiform papilla are normally smaller. And you can see that, like when you look at your tongue, you'll see there's smaller little bumps on the front. And then when you look at the back, they're like much larger bumps. Um, it looks like more bumpy in the back. Uh, <clears throat> the fungiform papilla are typically more, we actually have them like laterally, as well as kind of like scattered throughout the like anterior aspects of the tongue. And then the valate papilla are really large papilla that are back in the posterior regions of the tongue. Or the posterior part of the anterior aspect, right? So like right here. So I told you guys that the tongue was muscular, right? Like the actual mass of the tongue is made up of muscles. And they're actually very, very strong muscles. When you look at the, the strength of the muscle versus the size, the tongue is comparably very, very strong because the tongue's working a lot, right? When you talk about like how often your, your muscles are working, your tongue is working like constantly. Um, so anytime you talk, anytime you swallow, your tongue is, is pretty active. When we look at the tongue, there are four intrinsic muscles. These are actually like muscles that make up the mass of the tongue and then four extrinsic muscles that are attached to the tongue, but they're not actually like the mass of the tongue. So the four intrinsic muscles, again, these are intrinsic, think like internal, like in the tongue. Those alter the shape of the tongue. So when those contract, the tongue alters shape, right? You can make it flat, you can make it kind of short and thick, you can kind of curl it a little bit, you can point it. Those are the intrinsic muscles. If you look over in this picture here, these are showing us the intrinsic muscles of the tongue. Um, on the, uh, like the outsides, there are two longitudinal muscles. So there's a superior longitudinal muscle up top that goes like this. And then on the bottom, there's an inferior longitudinal muscle. Let me change colors. So the superior longitudinal muscle and the inferior longitudinal muscle. If you look at this picture down here at the bottom, <clears throat> uh, that picture I added and I posted it to you guys and you're like the practice pictures for the lab exam, I posted this on there. Um, but there's the superior longitudinal muscle up here and then that inferior longitudinal muscle is underneath the tongue. Um, inside the tongue, like if you looked under the longitudinal muscles, you would see vertical and transverse muscles. So the transverse muscles right here, right underneath that longitudinal, and the fibers are transverse, right? Like they go horizontal. And then the vertical muscles right here, right? The fibers are vertical. So it goes like superior longitudinal, then transverse, then vertical, then inferior longitudinal. 
Then there are four extrinsic muscles, right? These are the muscles that alter the position of the tongue. So like when you stick your tongue out or you curl it over the side of your mouth or anytime you're moving your tongue to a different position, that's because of the extrinsic muscles. Um, if you look down here, you can see the extrinsic muscles include the palatoglossus, gloss like the tongue, right? Palato because it goes up to the palate. You can also see over here in this picture, the palatoglossus up here. Um, <clears throat> the styloglossus, like this, goes back to the styloid process. So styloglossus, like this. Um, the hyoglossus right here goes down to the hyoid bone. So this right here would be the hyoglossus. And the genioglossus is this kind of fan-shaped muscle right here. We'll talk about the genioglossus a bit because that um, the genioglossus is important for keeping the tongue pulled forward so that it doesn't prolapse back into the throat. Um, speaking of, mention the innervation of the tongue. Um, the tongue has both motor innervation to control movements as well as um, sensory innervation, both special sensory and somatosensory. Um, <clears throat> the motor innervation to the tongue, so the nerve that controls movement of all of the muscles of the tongue is cranial nerve 12, the hypoglossal nerve. That's all of the muscles except the palatopharyngeal muscle. The palatopharyngeal muscle is innervated by cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve. But all of the other muscles of the tongue um, are controlled by the hypoglossal nerve, cranial nerve 12. Sensory innervation to the tongue varies based on if it's the anterior two-thirds of the tongue or the posterior third of the tongue. Um, and then also if it's general sensory or somatosensory. So when we look at the front of the tongue, um, the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, general sensory information, so this would be stuff like temperature, for example, right? Temp, texture, um, pressure, all of those general sensory things. Um, those, those signals are carried by the lingual nerve, which is a branch of um, the trigem or which is a branch off of the trigeminal nerve, specifically the third branch, which is the mandibular nerve. So general sensory information from the front of the tongue is carried by the lingual nerve, which is a branch of the mandibular nerve. Special sense, so like taste, I mean, taste information from the front of the tongue is carried by the corda tympani nerve, which is a branch of cranial nerve seven. Um, cranial nerve seven is the facial nerve. This becomes important in Bell's palsy. We've mentioned this a couple times. We've mentioned Bell's palsy. Um, when there's, you know, some like temporary um, inflammation and temporary irritation of the facial nerve on one side. And we talked about how um, like that one side of the face that's affected will typically droop, right? The person can't blow up their cheeks strong on that one side. The eyelid typically droops. They can't blink on that one side. Another sign of Bell's palsy when there's facial nerve involvement is um, that they lose the sense of taste on the front of the tongue. Well, this is why, because it's the facial nerve that carries um, taste information from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. The back of the tongue, um, all sensory information is carried by the glossopharyngeal nerve. And so all sensory information, whether it's general sensory or special sensory, is carried by cranial nerve nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve from the back of the tongue. Um, the gag reflex is a protective mechanism that we have to help prevent choking. So um, when you're not actively swallowing something, 
if something you know touches the back of your tongue, that should stimulate the gag reflex, right? Your throat muscles will, will um, you know, all contract and you'll try and push whatever that is out um, to try and stop things from going down your throat when they shouldn't be going down your throat. We use the gag reflex or we test the gag reflex during a neuro exam of cranial nerve nine, oops, nine and 10. Um, when we're doing a, um, an exam for cranial nerves nine and 10. So that gag reflex, this is when you touch the posterior third of the tongue, um, that should stimulate the gag reflex. The efferent limb, so like the sensory limb, the actual sensation of pressure back there in the third, um, is carried into the, the brain, right, by the glossopharyngeal nerve. We just said that everything to the back of the tongue is the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, so just sensing the fact that something is back there is the glossopharyngeal nerve or cranial nerve nine, and then the efferent limb where the um, where the the motor signal is sent out to the muscles of the pharynx, um, the oropharynx specifically to like you know close up and get rid of that, is um, carried by cranial nerve nine again glossopharyngeal and then also ten. Um, another important clinical implication in regard to the tongue is that if the, um, the genial glossus, that was that like fan shaped muscle like this that was underneath the tongue, that's the one that I told you guys was important to help kind of keep the tongue pulled forward. If that genial glossus is, um, is paralyzed, then it doesn't hold the tongue forward anymore and the tongue shifts posteriorly. Um, sometimes this is just on one side. If it's just on one side, then the other side helps to kind of hold the tongue anteriorly and that doesn't block the airway. But if both sides are paralyzed, um, then the tongue can slide backwards and block the airway. That's what happens under general anesthesia. Um, when somebody goes under general anesthesia, you always you know, insert an, an airway, right? That's why you have an, an airway maintained in these patients because general anesthesia results in complete relaxation of the muscles, including the genioglossus muscle on either side. So there's nothing holding the tongue anterior anymore and the tongue just falls backwards into the oropharynx and it can completely block the airway. I'm kind of along the same lines that genial glossus, the muscle that holds the tongue forward, is innervated by the hypoglossal nerve, right, which you guys know is cranial nerve 12. Um, the hypoglossal, hypoglossal nerve innervates the glossopharyngeus. So when the hypoglossal nerve is damaged, um, that can cause paralysis of the genioglossus, which we just looked at. Um, this can happen due to um, trauma, right? When there's some sort of severe trauma, um, you know, to the face itself, you can fracture the mandible um, and fracturing the mandible can then, you know, tear or damage the hypoglossal nerve. Um, it can also occur because of some sort of a lesion. So when there's a lesion, some sort of cancerous lesion, for example, um, on the nerve that can interfere with function and then that can also result in paralysis of the genioglossus. Um, also, remember that the hypoglossal nerve is not innervating just the genioglossus muscle. The, um, the hypoglossal nerve innervates almost all of the muscles of the tongue. Um, <clears throat> so the tongue is very, very dependent on the hypoglossal nerve. So when there's um, paralysis to the nerve or some sort of a lesion on the nerve and the nerve stops stimulating those muscles, that results in paralysis and atrophy of half of the tongue. Um, because again, it's going to almost all of those muscles, all of the intrinsic muscles and um, three of the extrinsic muscles of the tongue. That paralysis and then atrophy or like um, because the muscles of the tongue aren't working anymore, they atrophy, right? meaning they like start to wither away. So um, half of the tongue starts to atrophy and kind of like deteriorate and then it doesn't work. Now that's on the ipsilateral side is the damage, meaning 
same side. So if I told you that you know, the patient had a lesion on the right hypoglossal nerve, um, you would expect you know, paralysis on the right side of the tongue, right? the ipsilateral side, the same side. When this is the case, when there's paralysis of one side of the tongue um, and you tell the person to stick their tongue out, the tongue will deviate towards the affected side. The reason for that is that the other side works. So the genioglossus on the unaffected side um, will be kind of pulling the tongue um, or pushing the tongue out. So if you think like, okay, if you stick your tongue out and this side, um, or here's my left side, the left side is sticking out, but the right side's paralyzed, it's not. So the right side's just sitting like this, but as the left side push tries to push out, the tongue's gonna kind of like turn like that, right? It's gonna be kind of pulled towards the side. So the tongue deviates towards the affected side or towards the paralyzed side because the genioglossus on the other side is trying to push the tongue out, but the other side's not moving. So I, that's a good question, right? Like on an exam or a quiz or whatever, um, or that's good for, for patients. You ask them to stick their tongue out and you see, can the tongue protrude? Does it protrude evenly on both sides or does it deviate towards one side or the other. If it deviates, it deviates towards the affected side. Think like it points to the bad side. Lingual carcinoma is cancer of the tongue. Um, cancer of the tongue is most common in patients with heavy tobacco use. Um, that can be smoking, that can be chewing tobacco. Um, but heavy tobacco use is a, a huge risk factor for lingual carcinoma. Um, heavy alcohol use is also a risk factor. Um, HPV infection is a risk factor as well, but tobacco is a big one. Um, <clears throat> lingual carcinoma metastasizes to different lymph nodes depending on where on the tongue the lesion is or where on the tongue the tumor is. Um, malignant tumors in the posterior tongue typically uh, go straight back to the nodes. So they metastasize to the superior deep cervical lymph nodes on both sides. Remember your deep cervical lymph nodes are um, like going down either side of the neck with the internal jugular vein, right? So you've got like your internal jugular vein coming down underneath this, um, the sternocleidomastoid. And along the internal jugular vein, you have your superior deep cervical nodes and then down lower your inferior deep cervical nodes. Malignant tumors from the posterior aspect of the tongue typically just go straight back to the nodes right there. So they're going to the superior deep cervical nodes. Tumors in the apex and anterolateral parts of the tongue, so if it's in the front of the tongue or like kind of the, the front sides of the tongue, that typically isn't going to just go straight back. Lymph from that area typically goes down and then back. So um, this is gonna metastasize to the inferior deep cervical nodes um, as opposed to the superior. Um, tumors in the apex and interolateral parts typically don't metastasize right away. Um, they typically don't spread until much later in the disease, which is a good thing. Um, remember that the deep cervical nodes are really close to the internal jugular vein, right? We said that they run right alongside the internal jugular vein. So um, it is possible that um, metastasis from the tongue can end up spreading to multiple areas along the neck. Um, for example, it can spread to the submental areas for um, like tumors in the apex and interolateral regions since they go down and then start to spread back. They can spread to the submental regions. And then as the tumor spreads down along the internal jugular vein, it can spread to you know, numerous other areas or regions along the submandibular, um, submandibular area and then along the neck. So it's not just these deep cervical veins. The, the metastasis can really spread down the neck. Okay, so moving from the mouth um, or the oral cavity to the nose, and then from there we'll go to the ears. The nose is part of the respiratory tract, right? Really like the very beginning of the respiratory tract, superior to the palate, right? So the palate really separates the oral cavity from the nose um, and nasal cavity. The um, nose is separated into right and left cavities by the nasal septum. There's a cartilaginous wall here that separates the sides of the nose and the nasal cavity. 
Um, the nerves in nasal cavity have multiple different functions. Olfaction is smell. So there are olfactory receptors that um, that bind to scent molecules and allow us to have the, the sensation of smell. The nose is important for respiration, right? We, we initially breathe air in through the nose and nasal cavity before it goes back into the pharynx. We also use the nose and nasal cavity to help prepare the air for the lungs. The lungs are delicate. They want air to be warm. They want air to be moist and they want air to be clean. So as the air flows through the nose and nasal cavity, we filter out debris. Um, we warm and humidify the air. Um, and then also the nose nasal cavity receive secretions, right? There's a lot of um, mucus secretions that drain from the sinuses into the nasal cavity and into the nose. And then we're also able to eliminate those secretions. Hence, when there's some sort of an upper respiratory infection, you know that there's a lot of secretions that come out of the nose. Um, and the, the hope there is that we're able to trap any pathogens and flush them from the body. Um, when we look at the nose, we see that, uh, again, this happens, we've got the, the, the area, if you will, is separated into the external nose, right, which is like this external area, and then internal from there, we have the actual nasal cavities. When we look at the nose, um, you can see uh, multiple different like kind of structures or parts of the nose. The root of the nose is this this top region of the nose. If you like right up here, if you look at this picture of the guy, you can see the root of the nose is like right here. The apex of the nose is this free end or the point at the very tip of the nose. And the dorsum of the nose is the line that extends down from the root to the apex. Um, <clears throat> the nares are like your nostrils, right? Like the openings, if you will. Um, these are the nares, or nares is singular, but plural is nares. So the nares are the openings into the nose. Um, the nares are, are bordered laterally, like the alle. So like here, and here, like the, the kind of fatty tissue where you can flare your nostrils, um, those are the alle, uh, plur uh, just plural, of the nose. The nose is um, a mainly cartilaginous structure. Um, <clears throat> on the very bottom of the septum, the vomer, which is a bone, does anchor the bottom of the septum. And at the very top of the dorsum here, like the root of the nose or bridge of the nose, there is the nasal bone. But the main mass of the nose itself is cartilaginous. Um, and there are a few major cartilages that you guys should be familiar with. There are two lateral cartilages. So you see like right here is a lateral cartilage. And then on the other side of the nose is another lateral cartilage. There are two alar cartilages um, or major alar cartilages. Here's one of the major alar cartilages. And then on the other side, there's another major alar cartilage. There is another tiny little minor alar cartilage back here, right? back here and here on either side. This area right here is actual um, like fatty tissue. It's not connective tissue. It's not um, actual cartilage. The cartilage is more centrally located. And then there's one septal cartilage. The, um, the very end of it is just like right here along the dorsum of the nose. But then the septal cartilage you can see continuing in here. And it's like a medial line down the center of the nose. Again, it forms a wall that separates the left and right sides of the nose and nasal cavity. Um, speaking of the nasal cavities, the nasal cavities, again, are the, the internal chambers of the nose. So, like, if you look at this picture right here, we've, we've sectioned it in half. You can see this is the nose that, that sticks out from the body, right? Um, specifically, when you look at that, this first little chamber here, like, again, where you flare your nostrils, that's called the nasal vestibule um, right here the nasal vestibule, which is just like a little skin-lined entrance into the, the nose and nasal cavity. Then you have like the external portion of the nose here, 
Um, then if you move back from that area, you get to the, the actual like internal chamber of the nose, um, which is the nasal cavity. The nasal cavity is lined with mucosa, um, specifically a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Um, this is a, a mucosa, so there's a lot of mucus that's produced and released onto the surface, and there are cilia present, those little extensions that, that move the mucus to try and keep it from dripping down into the lungs. When we look at the lateral walls of the nasal cavity, they're not smooth. They're not like flat bone um, on the sides. Instead, there are bony shelves that curl off of the lateral walls. So like from the lateral walls in towards the center, the bones curl like this. Um, and those are referred to as nasal conchi. Right? It looks like a concha, but it's, it's conchi. And think like a conch shell. The conch shell is the shell that curls, right? Um, and these are bony shells that curl. So um, there are three pairs of nasal conchi on either side. Um, they kind of curl off the walls of the nasal cavity. They're the superior nasal conchi, the middle nasal conchi. Um, our concha is singular. So the superior nasal concha, middle nasal concha, and inferior nasal concha. Now, um, they divide the nasal cavity up into four little like passageways. So as the air flows into through the nasal cavity, it flows through a passageway. So like it flows through there, or flows through here, flows through here, or there's a little passageway up here as well. Um, three of those passageways are called meatuses. There's a, um, a superior meatus, a middle meatus, and an inferior nasal meatus. There is a fourth little like passageway that's called the sphenoethmoidal recess. Um, the sphenoethmoidal recess is like on the posterior, oops, posterior and superior to the superior concha. So if you look at, um, like if you look at this top picture right here, this is the superior um, nasal concha. And right above and behind it, like right here, there's a little recess where the sphenoidal sinus can, um, can like um, release mucus and release fluid, fluid into the nasal cavity. So this top little recess right here is the sphenoethmoidal recess. And right behind it in pink, this is the sphenoidal sinus, right? So the sphenoidal sinus just dumps fluid right through into that recess. Then, you know, underneath the superior nasal concha, there's a superior nasal meatus. And then under the middle one, there's a middle nasal meatus. And then under the inferior, there's an inferior nasal meatus. Um, if you look down at this picture down here, um, just when you're looking at it, if you get confused, the middle nasal concha, the middle like shelf has been cut so you can see behind it. So typically there's the superior um, concha here, then the middle was cut right there. So there is a middle right here and then the inferior right here. And here you can see the sphenoidal sinus and it opens up into this little recess right here, which is called the sphenoethmoidal recess. Okay, so here um, we talked about the, the superior part, right? Like the little superior recess up here. Um, <clears throat> then we'll see the, the three other passageways, the nasal meatuses. The superior nasal meatus, again, is between the superior and middle concha. So the superior nasal meatus is like right in this region right here. Um, <clears throat> it accepts fluids from the posterior ethmoidal sinuses. Um, there are you know, anterior, middle, and posterior ethmoidal sinuses. Um, so there are multiple ethmoidal sinuses, but the posterior ethmoidal sinuses will dump into this superior nasal meatus. 
The middle nasal meatus is between the middle and inferior concha. So between the middle and inferior concha is like this right here. Um, this communicates with a lot of different sinuses. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's a lot of fluid that's coming into this middle nasal meatus. It communicates with the frontal sinus. Um, it communicates with the middle ethmoidal sinus. It communicates with the maxillary sinus. I'm not really worried about you um, like memorizing the location of all of the, the different hiatuses because there's um, there's so much terminology. It's like there's a hiatus and then in there there's um, there's you know the bolo that you can you can name and then there's the frontonasal um, the frontonasal duct that you can name and there's like three structures that you can name for each of the sinuses that are emptying into the nasal cavity. And it's not really important. I just want you guys to know that the nasal cavity accepts secretions from the sinuses. Okay, so the sinuses um, are mucosa lined, mucus is made in them, the mucus drains from the sinuses into the nasal cavity. Um, <clears throat> I do want you guys to, uh, to look here though and see in the inferior nasal meatus, that's where the nasal lacrimal duct opens. So um, right down here, the sinuses are really emptying mostly into the um, the middle nasal meatus right here. And in the inferior nasal meatus, you see the opening of the nasal lacrimal duct. Um, the nasal lacrimal duct is where tears drain. This is why like if you're crying a lot, why your nose starts to get runny, um, because the tears drain through the nasal lacrimal duct into the nasal cavity, right, and your nose gets runny, and then the excess tears that can't drain spill over, um, and that's, you know, tears that are running down your cheek, but your nose does get, get runny when you cry because some of that fluid drains through the nasal lacrimal duct and into the inferior nasal meatus. If you look a little bit back behind the nasal cavity, the nasal cavity ends like right there, um, and you get into the nasal pharynx, and you'll notice right behind that the opening of the eustachian tube or the auditory tube. Um, remember that connects to the middle ear. When we look at the nasal cavity, um, <clears throat> the nasal cavity is divided into a respiratory area and an olfactory area. Um, the respiratory area is the, um, the inferior two-thirds, or really kind of more, um, but the inferior region of the nasal cavity down here is the respiratory area. So that's the area that's responsible for warming the air, humidifying the air, um, filtering the air so that little dust and particles and pathogens all get filtered out of the air that we're breathing. And then that pass, whoops, sorry. And then that passes the air back into the pharynx, right, to go down the rest of the respiratory tract. The superior portions of the, of the nasal cavity, right, this top about one third of the nasal cavity, is the olfactory area. That's the area that's responsible for smell or olfaction. Um, this area is lined with a specialized mucosa that we call the olfactory epithelium. And there are olfactory receptors that are present there, little um, nerve endings that um, are scent receptors. They bind to scent molecules. You can kind of see them sticking out here. Right? These are all little nerve endings that respond to scent molecules in the air. Um, these processes, right, these little olfactory receptors, unite to form nerve bundles. And those nerve bundles pass up through the cribriform plate and in the olfactory bulb. So as they pass through the cribriform plate, remember that the cribriform plate is um, on the top surface or um, like the superior surface of the ethmoid bone. This was one of those structures. I, I posted a supplementary list for you guys of all the different structures in the school that you guys should know back from anatomy and physiology. The cribriform plate is one of those. So like if you take off the top of the skull, and you take out the brain and you're looking down um, so that you can kind of see like the base of the cranium. 
Um, in between, you know, where the eyes sit, you have the, um, the cribriform plate and there are little cribriform foramina um, with like little tiny holes in the cribriform plate. And those little tiny holes are where these nerve bundles pass through the ethmoid bone um, and then they unite to form the olfactory bulb. And then from there, you've got the olfactory nerves that go back. Oh, I forgot to show you. I'll show you nerve supply in just one sec. Arterial supply to the nasal cavity um, is relatively simple. Um, there are nasal branches of the facial artery. Um, this is a little confusing the way I wrote this, but the facial artery has a branch called the superior labial artery. Labia, like lips. Right, so the facial artery um, goes to the superior labial artery, the top lip, and then that goes up into like the anterior inferior part of the nose here. So the facial artery to the superior labial artery, and then that goes to the nasal cavity. So I have that listed down here. Okay, but those two are related. Um, the ethmoidal arteries, there are two ethmoidal arteries. There's an anterior ethmoidal artery and a posterior ethmoidal artery. Um, there's also a sphenopalatine artery, uh, and then the greater palatine artery as well. Now, these arteries do anastomose um, on the anterior nasal septum. So the, I'll show you in a picture, but like all the arteries kind of come together in anastomose or meet each other um, on the nasal septum. So there's this really, really rich um, area we call this box plexus. Kisselbach, Kisselbach's plexus. It's a um, like a, an area here, kind of in the front of the nose, that's just really rich in blood vessels. Uh, that's an area that, that you can like if um, if you you damage that area, it's likely to bleed a lot. Venous <laughs> drainage. Um, occurs via multiple different veins. There's the plexus of veins that just um, start to collect the blood deep to the mucosa, and then they drain into the, um, the sphenopalatine vein, which goes into the pterygoids, and they drain through the facial vein, um, through the nasal vein, and then also the, um, the, the vessels kind of anterior and superiorly can drain up back into the cavernous sinus, which remember is one of the dural venous sinuses that we talked about in a previous lecture. Um, the nerve supply to the nasal cavity is via the trigeminal nerve, um, cranial nerve five. It's via two different branches though. So if you look at the nose, the nose kind of comes down like that. You can draw a line through the nose like this and the um, anterior and superior half of the nose is innervated by um, V1, which is the ophthalmic nerve. And the posterior and inferior part of the nasal cavity is innervated by V2, which is the maxillary nerve. Here you guys can see um, the arterial supply to the nasal cavity and the venous drainage. Um, arterial supply, here you see um, the superior labial artery. Remember, so that comes from the facial artery. So, and then this is the upper lip right here. So superior labial um, goes into the anterior part of the nose here. Um, we have the anterior ethmoidal artery, the posterior ethmoidal artery, the sphenopalatine artery, and then the greater palatine artery. Um, Kisselbach's plexus, this is this area right here um, on the septum, the anterior septum, where all of these um, vessels all kind of anastomose with each other. Um, venous drainage, you guys can see. Um, so this is drainage going down ultimately to the facial vein. Um, you can see here, the nasal vein. Here, these are the ones that are going up um, back to the cavernous sinus up in the cranial cavity. 
Um, here we have drainage ultimately going to the parrot that um, the pterygoid. Um, <clears throat> so um, the paranasal sinuses. Paranasal sinuses are like kind of large open areas that are present surrounding the nasal cavity, and the sinuses are all connected to the nasal cavity. Um, the sinuses are again air filled kind of extensions so there's like little openings and then they open up or like kind of broaden out in the bones um, and these are mucosa lined so mucus is made in these and then the mucus drains into the nasal cavity um, really quick when we look down here there is an error on this picture down here this has the maxillary sinus as these green ones that is not the case the maxillary sinuses are these blue ones these large sinuses like right up here by the maxilla those are the maxillary sinuses this green one here and here these really like posterior ones those are the sphenoidal sinuses And those are the sphenoidal sinuses in green, and then the maxillary sinuses are in blue. Um, here you can just kind of see, I added this picture here, but this kind of shows you a little bit better, I think, like where the sinuses are located in conjunction with all of the other structures that are present. Um, but there are frontal sinuses. The frontal sinuses are right up here um, <clears throat> in the frontal bone, right, like the very front of the forehead. There are numerous ethmoidal sinuses. Um, so the ethmoidal sinuses are like these lots and lots of like little sinuses that you see right here in the ethmoid bone. So anterior, middle, and posterior ethmoid sinuses. Uh, the sphenoidal sinuses, again, are like the posterior most sinuses back in the sphenoid bone. So um, the sphenoidal sinus you see right here. You can see how far back that is. Right behind that is the cella tercica where the pituitary gland sits. Um, and then the maxillary sinus. The maxillary sinus is this large sinus that's um, like right here. A lot of times when the sinuses are, um, like when there's sinusitis or there's a lot of pressure on the sinuses, patients will have facial pain like um, here along the maxillary sinuses or uh, like a headache um, when there's sinusitis as well, which we'll talk about. All right, so let's talk about a couple different um, clinical scenarios. First, we'll talk about nasal fracture. Um, <clears throat> remember that there, the majority of the nose here is cartilage, but we said that right up here at the root of the nose, the bridge of the nose, there is the nasal bone. And if you look up here at this x-ray, you can see you know, the, the frontal bone here, and then you can see this nasal bone. Um, and that nasal bone can get fractured. You can see there's a tiny little fracture right there. Um, this is common in motor vehicle accidents as well as in contact sports. Um, especially now, we have like a lot more people doing, you know, boxing and, um, <clears throat> what's it called in the ring? I can't believe I can't remember it. Um, but whatever, all different types of martial arts and whatnot, um, it's really common for the nose to get broken, have a nasal bone fracture. Um, this usually does result in some deformity of the nose. It can just be like a bump that's present here. It can be just a little um, a little lateral deviation or like a little curve in the nose right there. You can see here um, that there is quite a deviation present right there where the fracture is present. Um, especially if it's a lateral blow, if the lateral blow, it kind of puts it off and you can really see a curvature there in the nose. Um, epistaxis usually occurs. Epistaxis is nosebleed because the area is highly vascular. Um, severe fractures may completely displace the nose. Injury resulting from a direct blow is much more dangerous than a lateral blow. Um, a lateral blow can, you know, off-center the nose, but it's not as dangerous. If there is a direct blow, you can actually fracture the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. Um, the cribriform plate, again, it's like right up above the, the, um, the nose area right there, like the, the superior regions of the nasal cavity. So as you push up and back, you can fracture 
like this area right here. Um, if you fracture that area, that's considered the base of the skull, right? All of this, like, baseline of the skull. Remember, any time we fracture the base of the skull, we're worried about cerebral spinal fluid leaking out. Um, it can mix with the blood, and in that case, we can start to see CSF rhinorrhea. Rhinorrhea is just like a runny nose. Um, so, um, in this case, like, obviously, we'll have probably blo broken blood vessels as well, so there'll be blood coming out of the nose. The nose will be runny, um, but it's, it's kind of like a watery blood, and that's because there's CSF coming out of it. Um, remember when you're looking at the blood that's coming out when you're worried about some sort of a basal or fracture um, that you can look for halo sign and halo sign is where you know you let the, the blood that's coming out sit on a paper towel or whatever and you'll see that there's like different areas there's like the blood and then there's like another ring where it's lighter um, from like the CSF right you kind of have these couple rings that, that go out from the center the nasal septum can be deviated um, laterally to one side or the other. Remember that the septum is this, this cartilaginous wall that goes down the center, um, and it should be along the midline. Um, but there are various things that can you know, cause it to deviate towards one lateral side or the other. Um, sometimes this is because of some sort of a birth injury. Birth is kind of a traumatic experience, and that can um, deviate the septum. It can also happen because of some sort of injury during adolescence or adulthood. Sometimes we don't know why it's happened, but you know it's relatively common for people to have a deviated septum. Um, if the septum is severely deviated, so it's, it's really far off the midline, it can actually come in contact with the lateral wall of the nasal cavity, and that actually restricts airflow on that one side. So like if you plug one nostril, it's very difficult to get air through the other one um, in a really severely deviated septum. And this really, uh, when people have a deviated septum, they typically snore pretty loudly. Um, the worse the deviation, the worse the snoring. Epistaxis, again, is just a nosebleed. Um, nosebleeds can happen for various different reasons, um, and some people are more prone to nosebleeds than others. Trauma can damage the capillary network in Kisselbach area. Remember, like in the anterior aspect of the nose, we said that we have all of these arteries that anastomose with each other, um, and in that area, there's a whole lot of rich capillary beds. It's got a lot of blood flow. So if there's some sort of trauma to that area that damages that capillary network, the nose bleeds, epistaxis occurs. Um, when, especially like little kids and stuff, but they pick their nose, um, when people are picking their nose, that can tear the veins that are in the vestibule of the nose, which is this area here, and that can result in bleeding. Um, when blood spurts though, like if you've ever seen blood literally just spurting from the nose, um, that's not your typical Nose bleed. Um, that occurs when an actual vessel, like an actual artery rather, is ruptured. Um, uh, epistaxis can also result because of different, um, like systemic things, different systemic issues. Um, severe hypertension can result in nosebleeds um, just simply by having too much pressure that it makes the, the vessel burst, if you will, um, like small capillaries blow out. Um, <clears throat> if patients have, um, if patients are on blood thinners and the blood thinner is uh, working too well, if you will, if you will, an INR is a blood test that we use to monitor like warfarin and how well warfarin is working. Um, if their INR is too high, that's like their blood is too thin um, and nosebleeds are a common sign of that. Um, infection, some infection can result in an epistaxis as well. Rhinitis. Um, rhinitis is when somebody has a swollen and inflamed nasal mucosa. This is really common in upper respiratory tract infections as well as when patients have allergies, so like seasonal allergies, or if you're you know, allergic to a cat and you go stay somewhere for the weekend where they have a cat, uh, rhinitis is, is really common when somebody will have really like kind of you know, runny nose and stuffy nose and really swollen um, and irritated nasal mucosa. Um, if this is due to infection, um, it's possible that infection can spread to numerous other areas just because of all of the connections um, that are present in the nasal cavity. Um, it can pass to the anterior cranial fossa because of the connections through the cribriform plate. 
um, in the FMOI phone. Remember that that's where the um, olfactory uh, nerves, right, the little nerve bundles from the olfactory receptors pass up into the brain um, through the crib reform plate. So infection can also spread through those little crib reform foramina. It can pass backwards to the nasopharynx um, because the pharyngotympanic tube or the auditory tube connects the middle ear to the nasopharynx. If infection passes back to the nasopharynx, it can also pass to the middle ear and we can have otitis media infection in the middle ear. Um, the paranasal sinuses, right, the frontal sinus, maxillary sinus, ethmoidal sinuses, those are all connected to the nasal cavity as well, so infection can really easily spread to them and the person can end up with sinusitis. And it can also spread through the lacrimal apparatus. Remember we said that tears drain into the um, inferior nasal meatus, the nasal cavity. So if there's infection um, that's present in the nasal mucosa, it can pass up into the eyes in the conjunctiva or the lining of the, um, the eye. Um, the nasal mucosa in general is uh, it's really prone to inflammation. If there's any sort of you know, allergic issue or infectious issue, because it's just super glandular and super vascular, that's its purpose. It's supposed to warm the air so it's really warm. There's a lot of blood vessels to keep it warm. It's supposed to, you know, moisten the air and make a lot of mucus. So that's natural for a lot of mucus to be produced. Um, so if there's any issue in the area, it really inflames quickly. Sinusitis, I just kind of mentioned, um, but sinusitis, itis is inflammation. So sinusitis is just inflammation um, in the sinuses. So inflammation um, and swelling of the mucosa that lines the paranasal sinuses. This typically results in pressure building up in the sinuses, which then causes pain. Um, this is typically felt as either facial pain, where the pressure on the face hurts, um, or headache. When um, there's inflammation and swelling of the um, sinus mucosa, this can actually block the opening from the sinus into the nasal cavity. Now, the sinuses drain into the nasal cavities, right? Like I showed you that on that, that you know, one of the first slides we looked at, that the sinuses um, are lines with mucosa, mucus is produced in them, and then they're supposed to drain into the nasal cavity. And then the mucus can drain from the nasal cavity, either back into the throat or out through the nose. Um, but when there's swelling of the, the mucosa in the sinuses, it can actually block that opening, and then that prevents the sinus, um, the fluid in the sinuses from actually draining into the nasal cavity. And then the, the sinus actually, um, you know, fills up even more with mucus because it can't drain, and that creates increased pressure, uh, and then that creates even more pain in the area. Um, <clears throat> para, or sorry, pan sinusitis. Pan sinusitis is just when several sinuses are involved. Um, the maxillary sinuses are most commonly involved. So, like right, kind of here, um, these are most commonly involved. And the reason for that, there's a couple of reasons. For that one, the ostia, like the openings to drain are very small. So one, it's hard for fluid to quickly drain from the maxillary sinuses, and even a little bit of inflammation can plug up those ostea so that the fluid um, just builds up in them. <clears throat> also, the ostea are located at the top of the maxillary sinus. So they don't even start draining until they're full. Um, so, you know, they don't even start draining until they're full. So it's like it fills up and then you find out that the ostea are plugged and it can't drain and then you're already at maximum capacity. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that happens with the maxillary sinuses is because they're, they're located on opposite sides of the, the face. And because of where the ostea are, when you lay on your side, only one of them can drain at a time. So like if you lay on this side, you know, one can drain, but the other one's plugged up. And then um, then you'll feel like one side of your nose and, and face is like all plugged up, right? So then you'll, you'll switch sides and lay on the other side. And then that one can drain, but the other one gets plugged up. 
That's why when you're sick and you kind of lay on one side and then you can breathe out of that side or the other side and then you have to flip, right? And it results in that constant like flipping from side to side to side when you're all stuffed up when you're sick. That's why, um, because only one of the maxillary sinuses can drain at a time when you're laying on your side. Um, <clears throat> Infection in the ethmoid sinus can block drainage into the nasal cavity, right? Just like we saw with any of the other sinuses, when there's infection and swelling, it can block drainage. Problem, the problem with an um, infection in the ethmoid sinuses, if you remember where the ethmoid sinuses are, right? They're like back here um, and they go back. There's anterior, middle, and posterior, like heading back they're like between your eyes, if you will, and heading back like that between the eyes. The problem with these is that if drainage is blocked and the pressure starts to build up in them, um, that pressure can actually break through the medial wall of the orbit. Um, the orbit is just like the bony area around the eye. And that's a, it's a really thin wall of bone. It's not like thick, strong bone. So the pressure can actually break through um, the medial wall of the orbit, which is like the wall right, right in here, the orbit. Um, <clears throat> so as that, the, the drainage, if you will, comes through that area, through the medial wall, it can actually um, end up uh, pressing on and damaging the optic nerve. Um, that entry point, that, that breakage is, is pretty close to where the optic nerve leaves the eyes and goes back um, towards the optic chasm. And this can end up causing blindness if the optic nerve is damaged. Um, optic neuritis can occur, the right? inflammation of the optic nerve can occur um, if the nerve sheath is irritated in any way. Um, so maybe the nerve isn't actually, um, you know, damaged so much that it causes blindness, but it can be irritated for a time until, you know, the area is, is cleared. Okay, that's it for the nose and nasal cavity. Um, now we'll move on to the ear. So the ear is divided into three regions, the external ear, the middle ear, and then the internal ear. And each kind of has its own function. We'll talk about them all in detail, but just to introduce them. Um, the external ear, this part out here, and then the ear canal. Um, the external ear just catches sound waves and um, like funnels those sound waves in and transports, transmits that sound into the middle ear. The tympanic membrane, which um, in lay terms is the eardrum, the tympanic membrane separates the external ear and the middle ear. So you have like your ear and then your ear canal goes in and um, or external acoustic meatus goes in and then you have your tympanic membrane right here. And on the other side of that tympanic membrane is the middle ear. And then from there, the internal ear. Um, the middle ear contains the auditory ossicles um, or bones. These are the smallest three little bones that we have in our body, the malleus, incus, and stapes. Um, so these little tiny bones, they connect to the, um, they connect to the tympanic membrane and then you've got them going like this and then they connect through to the internal ear. Um, also, we have the pharyngotympanic tube. Um, remember, we also call that eustachian's tube, which connects the middle ear to the nasopharynx. So it goes from the middle ear here and then opens up in the nasopharynx. And that allows us to equalize pressure from the middle ear into the nasopharynx. We've mentioned that quite a bit when we talked about the throat. The internal ear contains the actual like nerve endings and receptors and the organs that allow us um, to have a couple different senses. Um, one, equilibrium. There are these um, large things we call like semicircular canals that are um, responsible for equilibrium. There are a sense of balance. And then there's something called the cochlea. It looks like this like a spiral shell, if you will, and that gives us the sense of hearing. Right? And both of those are in the internal ear. So details. Um, we'll start with the external ear. 
The external ear includes the like cartilaginous ear that you can see here, as well as the external ac acoustic meatus or the tube that leads into the, uh, the tympanic membrane. The auricle is this outer cartilaginous part of the ear here. So it's all cartilage and then just like fatty tissue. The helix is this large superior raised area. And then we have an antihelix, which is a smaller um, and in kind of more like inferior raised area. So the helix and then the antihelix, which is kind of like Y-shaped. Um, it has the antihelix has these two crura, right? Like that make that Y and then it comes down like this. And then again, the helix is out here. Um, <clears throat> Concha is the deepest depression that's present. There are a few different depressions that are present in the ear, um, like the triangular fossa up here, um, the scaphoid fossa back here, um, Simba concha, but then um, just right here um, is the concha that leads into the ear canal. The lobule is this bottom portion down here where people typically get their ears pierced. That's a non-cartilaginous area. Um, that's why people typically get pierced. It's, it's softer, easier to pierce, and it doesn't hurt as bad when you pierce it. The external acoustic meatus is the actual passageway that goes in here. Um, the concha is just like the opening into it. Um, we we'll frequently call this the ear canal and it leads all the way into the tympanic membrane here. Um, there are a couple little cartilaginous protrusions that, that kind of go in and form a little bit of a covering over this opening. Next, we've got this opening where sound goes in, but we do kind of cover it a little bit here. The tragus is this, um, this anterior one here. The projection that overlaps the opening to the meatus anteriorly, and then the antitragus is this um, this kind of inferior, smaller projection that you see. So the helix is this big curve, and then the antihelix, the tragus, and then the antitragus. Um, here we see arterial and nerve supply to the external ear. Um, arterial supply to the external ear all comes from the external carotid artery. So the external carotid artery, which you see right here. The external carotid artery gives us the superficial temporal artery, right, which kind of comes up the front and up the temporal bone and then the posterior auricular artery, which goes up behind the ear. There are branches that come off of each of those that go to the external ear. Um, innervation to the skin of the ear is mostly via the greater auricular nerve and the auriculotemporal nerve. Um, the greater auricular nerve comes from the, um, the cervical spinal nerves, and then the auriculotemporal nerve, which um, innervates the superficial part of the ear here, is from the trigeminal nerve, specifically uh, V3, which is the mandibular nerve. There is this kind of central area here um, that's innervated by different, depending on the source you look at, there's um, like kind of various nerves that they say innervate this area, but for the most part, the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10, is implicated. Um, the external surface of the tympanic membrane, so like once you make your way in through the ear canal and you get to the tympanic membrane, the tympanic membrane is highly innervated. It is extremely sensitive. If you've ever like touched it on accident with a, um, like a Q-tip, which never stick a Q-tip in your ear, um, like deep into your ear like that, but if you accidentally touch the tympanic membrane, you'll like it hurts. It hurts very badly. It's highly innervated. But the external surface of the tympanic membrane is innervated by um, both the vagus nerve as well as the um, the auriculotemporal nerve or the um, the 
mandibular nerve. So speaking of the tympanic membrane, um, I added this picture right here just because the coloration of it, I think, is really good. It really shows you that kind of gray pearlescent color very well. Um, <clears throat> but this shows you the tympanic membrane, and, and this is important. You will be looking at the tympanic membrane when you do a physical exam quite a bit, so you should know what it looks like and what it should look like. Um, it's a thin, oval, concave, semi-transparent membrane. Now you can kind of see through it a little bit, and if there's a bunch of blood that's accumulated in the middle ear, you'll be able to see that. You'll see that it's really red and kind of bulging from all of the, the fluid or blood that's there. Um, this membrane is between the external ear and the middle ear. So when you do an exam and you, you look into the ear canal, you're going to look at and examine the tympanic membrane. When you view it with the otoscope, with the little tool that you use to look at it is the otoscope. It should be translucent, right? so like semi-see-through and kind of this pearly gray color, and kind of a nice shiny, kind of a pearly, um, shiny grayish color. Um, <clears throat> There should be kind of a, a shallow cone depression in the center, and then in the very center, you should see the umbo, um, which is like the, the peak of it. So there's like this depression area, and then in the very middle is the umbo. Um, you can also see the handle of the malleus. The malleus, remember, is one of the bones in the middle ear. So it's the malleus, that first bone in the middle ear, is literally embedded in the tympanic membrane. So like the, the handle of it here is embedded in this tympanic membrane. And then you can see the lateral process sticking out as well. So this is the handle of the malleus and the lateral process of the malleus. Um, we're looking at like the opposite side in this top picture, but you can see the handle of the malleus and the lateral process of the malleus. You should be able to see that. Um, also, from the inferior end of the malleus, um, like kind of going from the umbo, you should see what's called the cone of light. So if we look at this top picture here, you can see the, the malleus, right? You see the inferior most end right here, and then you notice this kind of cone of light right there. You should see that reflected cone of light kind of going towards the anterior and inferior um, part of the tympanic membrane in a healthy ear. Um, so if you look at this ear here, you can see kind of like you see the malleus going to the very center here at the umbo, and then you see the cone of light shining. Right? You can see it in this ear, this cone of light. Right? So you should see that reflected. Um, in general, the superior um, part of the tympanic membrane is more kind of thin and flaccid, and the inferior part is more thick with elastic fibers. This is more the tense part of the tympanic membrane. So this is what you should see. And you can also see, like in the ear canal, you can check the ear canal to see if it's really red and inflamed. You'll be able to see that if there's, if the person has, you know, um, like some sort of a, you can have bacterial infection, an otitis externa infection in the external ear, um, or there can be fungal infection, you'll see you know, red irritation in that area, or you can see sometimes um, like white buildup if it's a fungal infection. So you'll also examine the ear canal itself as you go in to um, examine the tympanic membrane. Now, the tympanic membrane moves in response to air vibrations. So sound creates vibrations in the air. And those vibrations right, are caught by our external ear and they're funneled in towards the ear canal and then they hit the tympanic membrane. And the tympanic membrane moves, right? It moves in in response to those vibrations in the air. And it transfers the force of the vibrations to the auditory ossicles. Um, or the little bones that are in the middle ear. So the, the force, right, it, the um, tympanic membrane pushes on the bones, and the bones push on each other, and then they push onto the cochlea, which is in the internal ear. So the whole point is to take, 
vibrations in the air, which are sound waves, and convert them into actual like physical movement um, in, you know, give them into the cochlea in the internal air um, or internal ear. So like, if you look at this picture right here, here's the tympanic membrane and you have the external ear out here. Then you have the middle ear and you see the bones, right? The malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The malleus, right, connects to the tympanic membrane and then it pushes on the incus and the incus pushes on the stapes and the stapes pushes on something called the oval window, which is connected to this cochlea right here. So as these sound waves come in, Right? They push on the tympanic membrane and it pushes on the bones and then the bone, I mean, and then the, the last bone, the stapes, pushes into um, the cochlea, which is again this curly thing here. Okay, so um, let's move on from the external ear to the middle ear. So the middle ear is inside the tympanic um, membrane and outside of this. So all that is the middle ear. Um, the tympanic cavity refers to the air-filled chamber in the temporal bone um, that's got these concave sides. And it's divided into the um, tympanic cavity and the epitympanic recess. Um, the epitympanic recess is just this area in green right here, right? Epitympanic, like the tympanic membrane is right here, right? Epitympanic is like above it. So that's the epitympanic recess um, right there, that area that kind of goes up above the tympanic membrane. Um, <clears throat> and then the rest of this is the, the tympanic cavity. The pharyngotympanic tube connects um, anteromedially, so it goes kind of towards the front and middle like that to connect to the nasal pharynx. Here's the pharyngotympanic tube right here, and again that allows us to equalize pressure in the middle here. Um, <clears throat> the tympanic cavity also connects posterior superiorly to something called the mastoid antrum. I'll show you in a second where like the opening is, but there's another opening in the mastoid antrum it's like a um, like an open cavity in the mastoid process. Which remember the mastoid process is like the really thick kind of process that sticks off the skull back here. You have the um, styloid process, which is really pointy, and then you have like the thick round mastoid process. Okay, so here we'll just take a second to kind of look at the um, the middle ear. You can see the the border or the walls of the middle ear. Um, when we look at the walls, the roof, like the top of the middle ear, is referred to as the tegmental wall. Um, this is the tegmental wall, or the roof is just a thin layer of temporal bone. And so there's just a little thin wall of the temporal bone that forms the roof. The floor of the middle ear is called the jugular wall. Um, you'll see it's just this little tiny layer of bone and it separates the middle ear from the internal jugular vein. So you'll see like that the internal jugular vein passes just by um, the roof, I mean, sorry, the floor of the middle ear. Um, the lateral wall is referred to as the membranous wall because it's formed by the um, tympanic membrane itself or the eardrum itself. The medial wall is called the labyrinth wall. So like this area right here, the medial wall, the labyrinth wall, because um, on the other side of that is the bony labyrinth. So all of these, um, like the outer walls, of all of the, the structures that are in the internal ear that's referred to as the bony labyrinth. Um, so that's the labyrinth wall. The anterior wall, which we can't see because it's like cut off so that we can see inside, but the anterior wall, which would be on the front of this, is referred to as the carotid wall. Um, 
this is the area that is, it's right by the carotid canal. So this wall separates the um, middle ear from the carotid canal and the carotid artery, where the internal carotid artery passed through the carotid canal to get into the actual cranium. Um, on this anterior wall, this is where the opening of the phrenotympanic tube is. So like right here, this is the phrenotympanic tube, right? And it opens right there on the anterior wall. The posterior wall back here um, is called the mastoid wall. Uh, that's where the opening to the mastoid antrum is, or the adductus to the mastoid antrum, which you see right here. That's the opening that goes to the mastoid antrum. Um, which again, the mastoid antrum is just like this, this kind of open area in the mastoid process. In the middle ear, um, again, we have the auditory ossicles or bones. These are tiny, tiny little bones. Um, <clears throat> and there's three of them, the malleus, incus, and stapes. They go in that order from the um, lateral aspect into the medial aspect, malleus, incus, stapes. They extend from the tympanic membrane all the way to the oval window, which connects into the internal ear. Um, so you see here, this is the external ear, right? You see the tympanic membrane. And then here, these bones, those are the ossicles. And then right here, the oval window is the little window here where the stapes pushes on. And as it pushes on the oval window, the oval window pushes in this way. Okay, so it kind of puts pressure or pushes in um, towards the internal ear, into the cochlea of the internal ear, which is that big, like, twisted, like, organ in the middle ear, or sorry, in the internal ear. Um, the malleus, or hammer, uh, again, is the one that connects to the tympanic membrane. The handle is literally embedded in the tympanic membrane. Remember when we looked at the tympanic membrane with an otoscope, you could see the handle of the malleus. You could see, like, the long like ridge like that um, in the tympanic membrane. The head articulates with the incus, the next bone. So you can see the handle here in the tympanic membrane. The head of the malleus right here articulates with the next bone, which is the incus. They meet up together. Um, the tendon of tensor tympani, the tensor tympani is a muscle um, and the tendon of that muscle inserts into the malleus. We'll see the tensor tympani in a second, um, but it's a muscle that inserts into the malleus and helps to stabilize the muscle. Um, the incus means anvil, or looks like an anvil, rather. That's this next bone right here, and it articulates with the stapes here. Stapes, like a stirrup, um, that's the last of the ossicles right here. Um, the base of the stapes is attached to the margins of the oval window on the labyrinth wall. So the base of the stapes right here is attached to something called the oval window. And the oval window, again, is like flexible and it can push in to this labyrinth. The base of the stapes is smaller than the tympanic membrane. So this force of vibration, right, like that, there's the force of vibration on the tympanic membrane, and then the th it gets smaller and smaller, and all the force from this big tympanic membrane gets transferred down or like condensed down to this really small oval window. Because that force of vibration is getting condensed down, it increases about 10 times across the ossicles as it gets to that oval window. So the force of vibration gets stronger, which is important because the force of a sound wave is not very forceful. So we need that force to be amplified a bit to actually be able to um, you know, be noticeable force as it goes into that oval window. But the amplitude Right, the amplitude of the vibration is actually decreased. Which is important. 
There are a couple muscles that are present in the middle ear that help to stabilize the ossicles um, and help to prevent damage to the ossicles because they are very small bones. Um, the tensor tympani we just mentioned a second ago, that's the one that um, attaches to the malleus. Um, but the tensor tympani extends from the sphenoid and temporal bones, as well as parts of the pharyngotympanic tube. And then it comes in and it inserts into the handle of the malleus. So this here is the tensor tympani. You can see it inserting into the handle of the malleus, which is where it attaches to the tympanic membrane. Um, the tensor tympani is innervated by um, the trigeminal nerve, the third branch of the trigeminal nerve, or the mandibular nerve. Um, it pulls the handle of the malleus medially, medially tensing the tympanic membrane. Um, again, this helps to decrease the amplitude of the vibration. Um, and this prevents damage to the internal ear when there's really, really loud sounds. The stapedius is the smallest little muscle that we have. Um, the stapedius is right here. It attaches to the stapes, um, so it extends from the pyramidal eminence on the posterior wall into the neck of the stapes. Um, it's innervated by cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve. Uh, and it pulls the stapes posteriorly, again, also stabilizing it. These are tiny, tiny little bones. So uh, when there's a really, really large sound, uh, or sorry, a really loud sound, we don't want them to break, um, you know, to vibrate like crazy and to break. So they do need to be stabilized. Um, we'll take a quick second to look at the internal ear. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the physiology behind it. It is kind of complicated, um, but you should have learned this at least in undergrad and then probably again a little bit in physio. Um, but we'll just take a quick look at the internal ear. The internal ear contains a couple different, um, a couple different organs. It contains um, what we refer to as the vestibulocochlear organ and it has the vestibular part and then the cochlear part. Um, the vestibular part is for balance, the cochlear part is for hearing. Um, so the bony labyrinth just refers to these series of cavities that are filled with perilymph, which is just a fluid, like perilymph fluid that flows through these cavities. Um, and again, this includes the cochlea. Um, the cochlea is this like spinny shell-shaped part um, the vestibule, which um, we'll look at in a second, but like in this area here, and then the semicircular canals, which are these um, these like three kind of um, semicircular canals that go at right angles to each other. Okay, so first we'll look at the cochlea. Um, in general, if you look at this top picture, this is the cochlea, right? So it's like this spiral-shaped organ. Um, if you look, you can see right here is the stapes. So the stapes is connected to it at something called the oval window. So you have like the oval window and opening into the tube and the stapes connects to it. The stapes is one of the ossicles. And remember when sound comes in, I mean the tympanic membrane vibrates, it pushes on those ossicles. So the stapes will push into that oval window and push in um, to this fluid that's inside. Um, when you actually look inside the cochlea, um, you'll see that it's not just one tube. It's split up into a few different sections. Um, the cochlear duct, and this is all for hearing. Um, the cochlear duct is uh, this like central region right here. This is what's referred to as the membranous labyrinth. It's got membranes on either on all the sides as opposed to bone. So there's like the bony labyrinth on the outside, and then this is the membranous labyrinth. Um, so the cochlear duct is the membranous labyrinth, and it's filled with a fluid called endolymph. On either sides of it, you'll see that we have um, the vestibular canal, the tympanic canal. So the cochlear duct in the middle divide, divides this perilymph filled spiral canal into two channels and these two channels the vestibular and tympanic area communicate with each other at the apex of the cochlea 
to the apex is like the tip of the goglia. So um, like you push up this side and you've got the purple the purple um, arrows go from the oval window all the way up and around to the um, apex and then it, it connects to the um, the red and then the red comes all the way back down and out the round window and in between those those two um, you see in blue the blue is the actual cochlear duct yeah, that's where the actual like um, the organ of cordy the actual um, nerve endings for hearing are located um, the stapes pushes in the oval window and that generates hydraulic pressure because these are filled with fluid, right? So if you push in one of them, you generate um, an increase in pressure in their hydraulic pressure. And that's a hydraulic pressure wave um, that's generated in the scala vestibuli or the vestibular canal and it's heading up towards the apex. Um, and eventually that pressure gets you know, push through to the other side, and then it ends up leaving at the round window. Notice, I think this said oval window. I think I said oval window twice. This is the round window. All right, so like the pressure, the state piece pushes in, it generates some sort of pressure. Somewhere along here, the pressure is going to push through, and then it ends up coming down the other side and leaving at the round window. I want you guys to just take a second and look at this bottom picture right here. Just notice like kind of what you, you're looking at here. Um, you'll notice that like, down here, this is a nerve, right? And notice the nerve has all these little nerve fibers that stick up like this. And these nerve fibers stick up into this. It's called the tectorial membrane, but the tectorial membrane is on top of the little nerve fibers. And anytime these nerve fibers, they're called hair cells, anytime they get bent, um, so anytime they, they get like pushed up against this tectorial membrane and they get bent, they'll send a signal um, that relates to hearing. Okay, so let's talk about that. The cochlear duct. Again, the cochlear duct is this central canal here. That's where all of the nerve fibers are, and um, that's where like the actual hearing takes place. The scala vestibuli and scala tympani, um, or tympanic and vestibular canals, those are just for, you know, fluid just moves through them and pressure changes occur. Um, it's this central organ of cordy that's the actual like hearing area. Um, the roof of the organ of cordy is the vestibular membrane, right? So like up here is a vestibular membrane and the floor is the basilar membrane right here. Um, the spiral organ or organ of cordy is on the basilar membrane. Notice the hair cells, which are just nerve endings. So there's these nerve fibers that come in and these little hair cells, which are just little tiny nerve endings, stick up like this and they stick up and they're embedded into this tectorial membrane. Okay, so hair cells are embedded into the tectorial membrane that overlays the basilar membrane. So what happens when there's um, stimulation, uh, sound waves, right, just like um, pressure changes in the air, sound waves will come in and they hit the tympanic membrane and they make it move, right? At whatever frequency the sound is, that's the frequency of the sound waves. And then that moves these bones. You can see like the different positions that they can be in, the ossicles. And as they move, this um, the stirrup, right? The stapes pushes into this oval window. Okay, so it's pushing into the oval window at a certain frequency. As it pushes into the oval window, it generates pressure, right? Because remember, there's fluid in this area. So, um, so as it pushes in, it generates um, pressure waves at a certain frequency. This hydraulic wave um, you know, that's flowing through, it's going to displace the basal membrane of the cochlear duct. And as it does that, as it pushes up, on the basilar membrane. So to see it pushes through and then that's pushing this through like that. The whole like central area here gets like bent or gets pushed out. That bends the hair cells of the spiral organ. And when they're bent, um, when the hair cells are bent, that signal gets sent up the nerve ending and we hear something. 
Now we hear different pitches of sound, different pitch is different frequency, right? So like a high pitch is a really high frequency, a low pitch is a really low frequency of sound. So this membrane here is um, sensitive to different frequencies at different points. So like the really, um, the really high pitch sounds are noted near the oval window. So like here, and um, like so high frequency short waves, and then the really um, low pitch sounds are located or heard down here. So the sound waves come through at a different frequency. Right, and each part of this is sensitive to a different frequency. So these parts here are sensitive to a really high frequency, and as we go down, it's sensitive to a lower frequency. So whatever frequency the sound is coming through, it'll bend that part of the membrane. Right, so the hair cells that are right here, you know, send a signal up, and whatever that frequency is, that's the pitch that you you hear or you notice. Right, if it were a different um, frequency or different waves, you would notice it maybe right here, and that's a different pitch you would hear. Uh, maybe it happens right here, and that's a different pitch of sound that you would hear. Um, so that's like the cochlear part, right, where hearing occurs. Um, the vestibular complex is where we notice balance and equilibrium, which balance and equilibrium are also in your ears. Um, here in the vestibular complex where there's balance and equilibrium, there's a membranous labyrinth filled with endolymph. So endolymph is just this fluid. Okay, so like when you look at this, the bony labyrinth is just the bone on the outside, right, that goes around this whole area. The membranous labyrinth is just this membrane-filled area, right, so in blue, it's like this membrane-filled area that's got endolymph inside it. And then there's specific structures in there that will, like, sense movement of the endolymph. So the utricle and saccule, um, here you see the saccule, and then here's the utricle. The utricle and saccule um, have special areas which are referred to as the macula. Um, so like right here is the macula, and then right here is the macula. The macula is the area where there's actual nerve endings. And these nerve endings are sensitive to gravitational pull and linear acceleration. So essentially what happens is there's all this fluid, like this thick kind of fluid. And then you see the nerve coming in. And there are these little nerve endings that are embedded in this like thick gelatinous stuff. So as we move certain ways, right? So as you like go and you stop or you accelerate, the fluid moves. And as all this fluid in here moves, it pulls on this purple thing, right? It pulls on the macula and that pulls on the nerve endings and stimulates them. And then you get this sensation of, you know, accelerating or stopping or whatever. Um, the three semicircular ducts, right? So here, here, and here. Um, these semicircular ducts are in the semicircular canals. Um, so the ducts are just like the blue part inside these canals. And you'll notice that um, these are just, there's like three of them that go at right angles to each other. So there's like an anterior, posterior, um, and it's lateral, um, but they all go at, at like right angles to each other. And you can see that in them, each of them has like this swollen ampulla at the end. So it's got like the duct and then there's a swollen um, ampulla at the end. And in the ampulla, it's got sensory fibers that are again embedded in this like thick gelatinous um, you know stuff so you have all these little sensory fibers that come into this gel well as you um, like rotate your head certain ways these canals get tipped you know in certain directions and that causes the fluid to flow through them well, as the fluid flows through this, it'll hit the gel and move the gel, and that stimulates these, these hair fibers or these nerve endings. 
So because these, these canals are located at right angles to each other along different planes, when you move your head a certain way, certain nerve endings will be stimulated. And that's how you can kind of figure out you know, your balance. That's how you feel where you are, depending on which hair cells are being stimulated. Um, so innervation, innervation to the, um, sorry, to the inner ear is via the vestibular cochlear nerve. which is cranial nerve eight, um, is the other vestibular cochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve eight. So you can see the vestibular cochlear nerve here. Okay, so you're looking at, the, over here, you're looking at the brainstem. You see cranial nerve five, and cranial nerve six, seven, and eight. Um, there, and then you can see it splits. And there's the cochlear branch, which goes to the cochlea, which is for hearing. And then there's the vestibular branch, right, which goes to um, like the semicircular canals, um, goes to the macula, um, and that's for balance and equilibrium. Internal ear injury, so injury to like the oracle, um, <clears throat> any sort of like external trauma to the external ear can cause bleeding within the oracle. Remember, there are blood vessels that feed the oracle um, and bleeding can occur. This can result in an auricular hematoma um, or blood accumulation. The blood typically accumulates between the perichondrium and the auricular cartilage. Um, remember, this isn't bone, this is cartilage. And surrounding cartilage, there's a thick vascular um, membrane uh, called the perichondrium. Right? Peri, like around, chondro means cartilage. So the blood can accumulate between this really vascular um, perichondrium and the actual cartilage itself. And that's the auricular hematoma. Um, if treated, if untreated, this can really like grow and then compromise or block off blood supply to the cartilage. And that leads to fibrosis or scarring um, of the cartilage itself. Treatment for this involves aspiration of the blood. So when there starts to be um, an, a hematoma that occurs, the blood needs to be aspirated or removed so that you don't block blood flow um, to the area. This is why um, an untreated auricular hematoma results in cauliflower ear. If you've ever heard that time or that term, it's common in boxers um, or like MMA fighters. That's the term I couldn't think of earlier, MMA. <laughs> Um, but boxers or MMA fighters will frequently have that cauliflower ear where the oracle like loses shape and starts to get kind of like just clumpy and chunky and all misshapen um, because of all of these auricular hematomas from getting, you know, punched or kneed or whatever in the ear a lot of times. Otoscopic examination is an important part of the physical exam. Um, this is when you'll use an otoscope to look in the external acoustic meatus and visualize the actual ear canal as well as the tympanic membrane. Now, um, you kind of, you, you need to pull on the oracle in order to straighten the meatus so that you can actually see the tympanic membrane well. Because the shape um, and the, the kind of direction of the ear canal changes as we grow, you, you pull the ear differently in adults and children. In adults, you pull up, out, and back. In kids, you pull down and back. The way I remember that, or in infants and in young toddlers, you pull down and back. The way I remember that is adults are taller, so you pull up. Kids are little, so you pull down and back. And that will straighten out the meatus. Um, 
caution, the meatus is relatively short in infants, so do not puncture um, the tympanic membrane. So if you take your otoscope and you just, you know, pull it out and jam it in there like you always would, you can damage the tympanic membrane. You have to be very cautious. Use a pediatric otoscope and be very cautious not to go in too far um, and puncture the tympanic membrane. The reaction that the patient gives you when you're trying to straighten out the meatus can be a great clue to the possibility of an infection. When there's an infection, an ear infection present, it's typically painful. And when you try and straighten out the meatus, that movement of the area hurts. So especially with little kids, um, be cautious. Don't just go in there and yank and shove your otoscope in. Be really careful and cautious and explain what you're doing and start gently. And you know, if the kid gives you an ah, that's a really good clue that there is an infection present because that's painful. Um, the tympanic membrane I showed you guys um, in pictures previously, but the, the tympanic membrane should be relatively translucent. It should be nice and shiny and kind of a pearly gray color. You should be able to very clearly see the handle of the malleus more towards the center. And at the inferior end of the handle, down towards the very middle of the tympanic membrane, you should see the cone of light visible. You remember we saw like the handle, like that's the tympanic membrane, you saw the handle of the malleus, and then from the end you saw this nice cone of light. Um, it should radiate anterior inferiorly in a healthy ear. So that cone of light should be radiating um, like towards the, towards the front and down, like, like this direction in a healthy ear. Um, because of the curvature of the tympanic membrane, like that's where it, the, the light radiates from your otoscope because you're shining light in with your otoscope and it radiates out that way. If there's extra pressure in the middle ear, for example, and the tympanic membrane is bending a different way, um, then that can change where that cone of light is radiating. Otitis externa. Um, itis, we said, was inflammation. Right, otic means ear, so otitis externa is inflammation of the external ear. So of the external acoustic meatus, uh, which remember is just the ear canal. So that's infection out in this area here, right in this outer ear. This is really common in swimmers. Um, if they don't dry their ears well after swimming and there's a lot of water that just kind of accumulates and sits in that area, um, it can be the result of a bacterial infection in the skin lining the meatus. Often we can see also um, fungal infections in that area, really common in swimmers because it's wet and dark so the fungus can grow. Um, typically we notice itching and pain in the external ear. Again, this can be worsened by applying um, or by pulling on the oracle. We said when we go to examine the ear, when you pull on that oracle, it can hurt worse. Um, and also pressure to the tragus. Remember the tragus is this little cartilage that sticks out right here. So pushing on that can also um, increase the amount of pain in, in otitis externa. Otitis media is still an ear infection, but in this case, it's an ear infection in the middle ear. Um, infection of the middle ear can result in um, pus or fluid accumulation in that area. It's typically associated with an earache, so a lot of like, pain ear area, as well as a bulging and red tympanic membrane. So the tympanic membrane looks irritated, it looks angry. Um, it's not that nice, you know, translucent, pearly gray any longer. And it can also bulge, um, so like be sticking outward. This is often secondary to an upper respiratory tract infection. Remember that the, um, uh, the pharyngotympanic tube connects the middle ear to the throat. So when there's an upper respiratory, upper respiratory tract infection, it's really easy for bacteria to transfer into the middle ear, especially in children. Um, because of the shape of the pharyngotympanic tube in kids, it's really easy for bacteria to transfer between the middle ear and the oral pharynx, or sorry, and the um, nasopharynx. So it's even, that's why otitis media is so common in little ones. Inflammation um, of the mucous membrane lining the tympanic cavity can block the pharyngotympanic tube. 
Remember the pharyngotympanic tube is how we equalize pressure in the middle ear. So if we block that, we lose that ability and it can result in ear popping. Um, an amber color, kind of like a dark, rusty, reddish colored um, bloody fluid can be seen sometimes through the tympanic membrane, um, which is not a great sign. Um, and if untreated, this can actually produce a scarring of the ossicles, which then impairs their movement, which thus impairs hearing. So it is important to um, to address once you see, you know, um, bloody fluid accumulating or bulging of the tympanic membrane. It is important to address with ear infections or otitis media. We'll talk about this in um, pharmacology more when we talk about antibiotics, but we don't always give antibiotics right away for otitis media. Frequently, we do the wait and see approach. Um, you know, see how they do for a few days. If it's still there um, after a few days, then we start an antibiotic because they are typically self-resolving. However, if it's severe, it does need to be addressed immediately because you don't want, um, you know, scarring and, and impaired hearing to occur. Um, perforation of the tympanic membrane. Um, can occur. Um, this result, or this is like what we would call a ruptured eardrum, right, because the tympanic membrane is the eardrum. This can result because of multiple different things. Um, a really severe untreated otitis media. If the pharyngotympanic tube um, is blocked, so you can equalize pressure that way, and you've got a lot of you know, pus and fluid accumulating and building up, it can get so severe that it ruptures the eardrum. Um, a foreign body can end up going in and rupturing the eardrum. So like that's what they say, never put anything in your ear that's smaller than your elbow. Anything smaller than your elbow can't actually fit in your ear. So in other words, don't put anything in your ear. Uh, I know it's really common for people to use Q-tips and, you know, put them in their ear and clean it, but your ear should be self-cleaning. You can clean, you know, the oracle, the outside, but your ear canal should be self-cleaning. If there's a lot of wax buildup at that point, your know, patient should go to the physician to get that assessed and cleaned if needed. Um, they shouldn't be putting Q-tips in their ears, and parents should definitely not put Q-tips in children's ears because they can't sense how deep they are, and it is possible to go in too far and to rupture the tympanic membrane, especially with little kids. You know, if you're cleaning a little kid's ear, there's no telling when that kid's going to jerk their head. And, you know, it doesn't take much pressure to rupture the tympanic membrane. So no Q-tips. Um, trauma it can also um, rupture the tympanic membrane. And then excessive pressure, for example, like scuba diving. When you go scuba diving, you're going down under so much water, there's increased pressure. Um, and you should be able to, you know, equalize pressure um, through the pharyngotympanic tube, but you know maybe that's blocked. Maybe there's some sort of um, you know stuffiness and swelling that you didn't realize you had that's blocking that drainage, and then you know, because of that you can rupture the or perforate the tympanic membrane. That's why they say you know don't go scuba diving if you've had an ear infection recently, um, <clears throat> because that increases the possibility that swelling will have blocked off that um, that you know pharyngotympanic tube. Minor ruptures of the tympanic membrane tend to heal spontaneously, um, but large ruptures usually require surgery in order to heal correctly. Uh, mer meringotomy um, is an incision to drain pus from a middle ear abscess. As we just mentioned before, like when there, when you get to the point where there's a ton of you know, pus or fluid accumulation where the tympanic membrane is just bulging really bad, um, at that point, a meringotomy is likely indicated so that you don't end up permanently damaging the ossicles. Um, this is typically made posterior inferiority, so like the back bottom part of the tympanic membrane, because this area tends to be less vascular, and it allows you to avoid the ossicles. Um, like if you're looking at the tympanic membrane, remember the handle of the malleus goes like this, and then the, the, uh, the ossicles kind of connect and go back from there. Um, so if you're, you know, inserting posterior inferiorly, you're avoiding the um, handle of the malleus and you're avoiding the ossicles. In chronic otitis media, 
um, drainage, so myringotomy and drainage follow, uh, from the middle ear is frequently followed by insertion of pressure equalization tubes. So when you hear like a kid say that they got tubes put in their ears, um, a tympanostomy is what that's called. Um, tubes put in the ears just to allow for um, better drainage from the middle ear and to try and prevent these really frequent severe um, otitis media episodes. Now this isn't done if you have a kid who you know really randomly kind of has an ear infection or has really mild ear infections. This is done when kids really frequently get severe ear infections that are you know resistant to antibiotics or you know end up in you know, procedures or myringotomy or whatever. So it's not just routine. All right, guys, that is it. Um, we got through the year. Thank you so much. And just shoot me an email if you have any questions.